you're talking about the degree to which pharma yes uh not only influences but has effectively fully captured journals medical schools medical associations uh, governmental regulators, all of the pieces of the puzzle necessary to create a totally fictional world. Yes. Which is what they tried to do during COVID. Yes. And so I call this the pharma game. Mm -hmm. And they, and I think part of what people don't get is, yeah, you know, 20 years ago, we all knew pharma was a problem, right? And like you, we all believed, oh, it's probably altering the science enough to matter. Yeah. Not writing it out of whole cloth. Right, right exactly. Um, so we're looking, what, what we're really looking at is the evolutionary product of the world we all thought we lived in, mm -hmm. right? Pharma having too much influence over regulators instead of it is the regulators. It is effectively the puppeteer and it is moving these puppets around to create the impression that science is being done to ensure the safety of the public. It's not true. 100%. Right? Up it is creates down. the impression, creates the impression. Absolutely. Creates the, and it's worse than nothing, right? Because the thing is, if you didn't have regulators, right? If all you had was your doctor and a bunch of pills, your doctor would be in a position to notice and to discuss with other doctors, hey, I don't think that pill is safe. Mm -hmm. Maybe stay away from that one. But the impression that is created through the journals and through this phony scientific work um, actually causes, I'm sure it causes doctors to override their doubts about safety, right? How could it not? Maybe I'm seeing, you know, maybe the pattern I'm seeing isn't really a pattern. Maybe it's sampling error. And I know that because, hey, here's a large study that seems to suggest exactly the opposite. Well, that, that's exactly it, right? I mean, the doctors, you know, when, when I think about medicine, I mean, not really my career, but if you look at the history of medicine, like, you know, some of the seminal books from the 70s, I mean, the pharmacopoeia at that time, the amount of medicines that we were using in disease, I mean, it was very small, right? Now you have huge amount of medicines, right? All coming through pharma funded trials and all that. And your, your point is, is correct. I mean, the average doctor, you know, they essentially, they have an implicit faith and trust into that, those institutions, right? The journals and and the, the 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 people who do the studies, and they think that there's an integrity, there's a code of ethics, there's you know all of these things, and they'll believe what they're told. And what's shocking to me, Brett, is how much they so easily believed that was break. You know, so like one thing, let's say you talk about ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. We know that doctors are too busy; they don't really read studies critically. Um, they'll read the abstract. First of all, even to read studies critically. I mean, you really have to say, like, what didn't they put in this paper? Like, what is missing? Like, there's so much things that you find out when you really think about a paper. And, you know, all these anomalies, like they'll present certain data in certain papers and leave it out of others. You have to ask you, why did they leave it out? You know, and so, but doctors, like, they read abstracts. And, you know, and especially an abstract from the top medical journal in the world, I mean, that abstract is thus truth, right? It's almost like one of the, you know, the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop, right? And, and, and how much they, they just, you know, like, I guess I use the example of, like, for me, like, this unveiling, right, of the scope and the scale of this capture and control, you know, was slow. I mean, it was slow and iterative during COVID. I mean, I, I was learning these, I was finding these astonishing and really disturbing facts of these things that they were just divorcing themselves from even pragmatic science or even, you, you know, it, it, these were policies divorced from science. And I was like, how can they do this? How are they getting away with this? And I will tell you the, the day that I remember being really the most upset and disturbed was the day that the FDA put on their website that there's no evidence to support checking antibodies before vaccination. <laughs> you know, when, when the vaccines came out, like my, my good friends and colleagues, like who were internists, who had offices, right? Their patients were coming to them for guidance around the vaccine. And I mean, the, I mean, their initial gut reaction was like, take a history. Did you have COVID? <laughs> right. That would be one way or check antibodies. And so like one of my colleagues, he was checking antibodies. And if you had a positive antibody, you can skip the vaccine. But here we had, you know, a governmental agency telling the entire country of doctors that this thing called natural immunity, which we've 
which is as an evolutionary biologist, <laughs> Brad, I think you can speak about natural immunity more than most. I mean, this is literally how we've survived, right? Uh, through history and viruses and, you know, organisms. And suddenly some words on a website and the entire country just goes with it without critical questioning, without a discussion. I mean, there was some stuff around that, but like, how did they cancel or disappear natural immunity with one page of a website? I mean, we yeah, were fascinating well, people who just recovered, Brett. I mean, you know, I, I the worst story I've heard, not the worst, I, I, I don't want to qualify it like that, but I had a patient uh, once about a year ago. She was um, a pharmacist who worked at a hospital. And she told me that the hospitalists at that hospital were vaccinating COVID patients upon discharge. Wow. And yeah, that to me was a wow moment. I said, wait a second. You know, because there is a, some precedent to that, like with flu, like people come in for some other reason during the flu seasons and, you know, the doctors will offer them a flu shot because they're captive right there. It's like, hey, you're here. What, we'll give you a flu shot. So flu shots kind of, you know, is like kind of a checklist upon discharge. So like, I get that. But here you had patients admitted for COVID, survived COVID, still probably a little rocky. Not all of them are well, but they're ready to go home and you're going to vaccinate them. With an old protein? That was the other thing. It was like late 2021. It's like, guys, we're, we're using a two-year-old protein. And anyway, your your answer that when you said, wow, that, that was what I said that day. I just, I literally was like, what is going on? The world has gone mad. Well, it's incredibly foolish for multiple independent reasons, right? On the one hand, and, and I guess the, the thing that's really frightening about this is anybody who's gone through medical school ought to be able to piece one, if not both of these together. Mm -hmm. One, the history of vaccine safety is not a clean record until Ooh. 2020. There are lots of cases where vaccines that were promising did not get through safety trials because they were dangerous. And there are cases in which vaccines that were released were withdrawn because they turned out not to be safe. Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea that vaccines are safe is dead on arrival. That is not a true idea. Right. Yep. If vaccines are safe, it's because we're good at the safety process. In this case, you had so-called vaccines that were a highly novel in their mechanism of action, really unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And B, the safety testing at best was truncated by time. And there is no way to accelerate safety testing because part of what you're looking for are long-term effects. And so there is no way to know that there wasn't something lurking five years out, right? So a doctor should be interested in taking anybody off the list of candidates that they can take off without a cost. Even yes. if these vaccines were highly effective and there were no harms that had been spotted, you should still want to vaccinate as few people as you have to because the potential of hurting somebody in some way that we didn't yet understand was something you couldn't take off the map. So natural immunity, that should be like, oh, what a relief. We don't have to take any risk with you because you got through it. Your immunity is going to be better than this vaccine, which provides one antigen. It's not broad. It's, it, it's yep. almost stupidly narrow. It's an old antigen, right, from a variant that is no longer circulating. So thank goodness we can take you off the list and not expose you to that risk. Every doctor should have seen that. And then on the other side, the part that's maybe harder to spot is you're dealing with a layered set of complex systems. What happens when you take somebody who has just recovered from the current circulating version of a disease and you inoculate them with something that triggers the production of a closely related antigen while mm. their immune system has not fully stood down from the infection it just beat, right? Yep. Does that make them more susceptible in the future? Does it make them less? Does it cause the immune system to think that it has failed to fight off the infection and to go into some kind of overdrive that we don't understand? There are a dozen ways that could go wrong. It's super complex. And and, and then the related uh, question, which we've explored a little bit, is what, do you, what happens when you give someone a vaccine for that narrow old antigen 
which is now quite different, right? It's mutating. Yeah, it's not the right. And we know a little bit about that with flu because that they've always done. You know, they're always a day late and a dollar short with the flu vaccine. But this was, this is even more. I think it's even more mutagenic than the flu. I mean, this thing was rapidly changing. Rapidly changing. I think in part or in large part because of the vaccination campaign yeah. itself, which creates an almost absurdly concentrated evolutionary pressure, which drives the virus around. Um, but in any case, the obvious caution that should attend medicine when confronting a novel therapy, right, was simply not there. The desire, it was like a religious desire to vaccinate people rather than a, hey, we've got no choice. We've got to do a lot of vaccination, but let's figure out who doesn't need it, right? You, you know, you, you, Brett, I mean, you're making, you say, the way you lay that out, right, it just makes so much sense. It's pragmatic. It's prudent. Those are all principles that you would think a doctor would employ, a physician would employ. And, and let's be fair, though, Brett, you know, what you're, the reason that you just articulated, there's, there's a percentage of doctors who did approach, and I think thought of it that way. Some, a very tiny number stood firm and stuck to those principles. But if you look at the, the population of physicians in this country, I think there was a large percentage who just believed what they were told that they didn't have critical thinking. But the one that's most troubling is that percentage, and I don't know what percentage that is, who knew this was wrong and were coerced and co they realized they couldn't put up resistance. If, if you did, you were going to be shunned and vilified and even unemployed. Right. I mean, if if you were in your office and you worked for an employer and you started telling patients, come, you don't need the vaccine, you don't need the vaccine. I mean, you're not around long. And, yeah. and those who thought it was the right thing because all the, the Fauci's and the experts and all the societies were telling you to vaccinate everyone. So you thought you were doing, you know, the best science. <laughs> I think there's a lot of physicians who literally thought like because the expert said so it's the right thing to do. Um, the best scientists and the best minds in the country in medicine are telling us to vaccinate anything that moves. Um, so let's do it. But th there was a proportion, I think, that thought like you, Brett, and, and they went along anyway. 